Hello and thank you for joining me on this presentation on formulating clay bodies for rapid open firing. Now I think it can be safely assumed that the earliest form of ceramics were fired in an open setting, that is fired without the aid of any heat retaining structure. It would only be a small step for instance to adapt a cooking hearth to fire dry clay vessels to very adequate ceramic temperatures. But that's not to say that open firing is a straightforward process, far from it. I have found over the years that open firing needs a very high level of knowledge and understanding and firing management. But at the heart of the whole process lies the clay and this is what I want to investigate further during this presentation. To the experimental archaeologist, open firing can be problematic, particularly considering the explosive temperature rise, which is difficult to regulate and puts pottery under extreme stress. Also, in looking for solutions, there is very little evidence for us to consider in the archaeological record, as it is by nature a rather transitory technique leaving very little trace. However, there are clues as to how we might conduct meaningful experiments, and these clues are to be found in open firing cultures, which have successfully operated right up to the present day. Here you can see one of my own experimental firings, based on examples in recent use. Although here hidden by flames, the pots are set on top of fuel and then more fuel has been arranged around the pots. Having the pots above ground level I have found to be vital in the process because those which are on the ground or that sit in a bed of ash will not be subject to enough heat transfer. Because of this a slow progressive preheat is not possible. So for instance the technique of slowly edging pots nearer and nearer to an established fire simply doesn't work in this case. Here you can see my interpretation of what I call a firing stack, again informed by similar structures in recent use. It is interesting to note that in this type of firing, a single pot is placed directly on the burning stack without any form of preheat. However, the extremely fast temperature rise very often blew my experimental pots apart, a common fault known as spalling. However, this was not always the case because on rare occasions some clays showed a high degree of tolerance and it was this anomaly that encouraged me to investigate further. Here are two sample pots fired in identical conditions and with identical tempering. On the left you can see the underside of a bowl with a substantial addition of opening material which is often called temper and fired for about 25 minutes. This clay, like most others, spalled. Spalling is caused by entrained water within the body, which if not purged through evaporation, usually by a very slow preheat, will at 100 degrees centigrade reach boiling point, with the resultant steam bursting open the pottery's fabric. Even so-called dry clay will have a significant moisture content, determined by the relative humidity of the surrounding air and even preheated pots, if not fired immediately, will very quickly take on water until the point of equilibrium is reached. The image on the right, however, shows the underside of a pot that has also been fired in a stack and which again took about 25 minutes to fire, but was not preheated. It is a glacial clay found locally and is extremely plastic and can tolerate large amounts of temper, 50% in this case, and still remains very workable. This body, which I call T14, consistently withstands the rigours of rapid firing, so I decided to investigate further. Now here is the clay at source. The site is on the North Norfolk coast in England and you can see the vast amount of unsorted material consistent with glacial tills. The materials are characteristically very varied, ranging from rocks, gravels, and sands through to very fine clay sediments. The clay material used in T14 is shown here. 
It is a relatively pure clay with very few coarse inclusions and was extremely plastic. It's unfortunate, but with the next northeasterly storm, it may well disappear from this location. The clay material was levigated to establish an approximate particle analysis. And here you can see evidence of clear divisions, residual water, clay and silt. The clay layer is most likely composed of clay minerals plus suspended ultrafine particles. The silt layer would be composed of fine granular non-clay minerals of very mixed origin and composition. After drying the two main sediments were weighed. Interestingly the amount of silt at 47% was unexpectedly large, especially considering the plastic nature of the material as a whole. This was considered to be significant. It was decided to synthesize a clay body which mimicked the behavior of T14, one that could be composed of standard and quantifiable materials. My thinking was that if successful, I would have a clear indication of the mineralogy, particle size, and particle distribution necessary for rapid open fired bodies. The material choices for the synthesized body were gradually refined through experiments on workability and firing behavior and the final set of body formulations were based around these key materials. To represent the clay mineral content relatively pure clays were chosen a Staffordshire Etruria marl and a bentonite these two clays gave me a flexible approach to plasticity, with a bentonite being a very plastic Montmorillonite clay. The silt of T14 averaged around 200 mesh grain size, so this was represented by a fine 200 mesh molochite. For the additional tempering, 50% in T14, I used a 16 to 80s grog which provided a well graduated particle size differential. After many experiments, a baseline formula was established which closely replicated the characteristics of T14. It became clear that the fine grade particle additions represented by the molochite or the silt in T14 was key to the working of the system. And here are the material parameters of the body called SY14 in parts by dry weight. The unusual relationship of material proportions are quite striking. Notice the relatively low proportion of clay and the very high non-plastic additions. The Etruria marl and the bentonite at only 29% still gave excellent plasticity and workability. The fine grain non-plastic addition here is molochite together with the grog temper make up a very large 71% non-plastic constituent. The key to the success of the body and its counterpart T14 is dependent on this clay to temper ratio whilst at the same time retaining a good degree of plasticity and workability. However, I found these attributes are only achievable with a fine grain non-plastic material. Without this level of addition the workability or firing resistance suffer. Perhaps it should be noted at this point that SY14 is very much a baseline synthetic formulation and represents the very extreme limit of firing tolerance. However, from the experimental archaeologist's point of view, it does provide a useful rationale for sourcing clays in the wild. Before I summarize the value of fine non-plastics, here is a short video of SY14 being fired in a stack. So here we have the firing stack and as you can see it's built up of split wood. The wood is very dry, that's really important. And it's built up into this staggered square configuration about 500 centimeters high. Inside there's more very dry split wood and uh, angled on the inside and then on top of that I've got a bit of um, dried reed kindling. I'm going to light the stack from the top and then when, it's when the fire is established I'm going to place the pot, this is the 
very, again, dryness is still very important, but it's a dry uh, SY14 synthetic uh, clay and just made into this um, simple coil pot. And I'm going to put it straight onto the top there and then let the fire do its work. So here you can see, looking into the firing stack, the vessel in the middle, getting very hot at this, this time. This is the critical time, at about 100 degrees C. The water vapour will be driven off as steam. And that's when one might expect spalling to occur. I'll be tending to the fire at this stage at regular intervals and rearranging the embers so that the heat transfer is as, as effective as possible. At this stage the pot is still subject to a lot of heat work from radiation and conduction. Although the overall temperature of the fire will now start to drop, it's the heat work, or in other words heat over time, which is more important. So, the firing's subsided. Here's the completed pot, lying in a bed of still warm embers. No spalling or cracking. And a really good ring to it. So although it's no substitute for a clay in the wild, it does give a good indication of what we might be looking for in terms of particle size and mineralogy. These experiments have shown that the natural inclusion in the source clay of fine grain non-plastic materials increase strength and workability reduce the need for a high clay mineral content and therefore increase the ratio of non-plastics. They bridge the particle size range from the coarse grains of temper to the ultra-fine clay minerals and they create a more porous body allowing water vapour and steam to escape. Well I hope this presentation has gone some way in explaining the importance of particle size, particle size distribution and mineralogy of clay bodies for rapid open firing. It's interesting to note that uh, in present day open firing cultures, potters often travel great distances in sourcing clay and even blends of different clays. They'll also search out and prepare fastidiously their tempering materials. And I have absolutely no doubt in thinking that the potters of prehistory would also share this level of technical knowledge and sophistication. Thank you for joining me.